Greetings fellow Earthlings and welcome to this tiny garage. This week we actually are going to go inside the engine and try to fix whatever is wrong in there. Now since the beginning uh, this mission has been to try to get as much information on this car and this engine in order to help us be able to fix it properly. Now when I bought this car I bought it off Mr. B. Hello Mr. B if you're out there, a very nice man. Uh, he did tell me a bunch of things about the car that he knew but he hadn't owned the car for very long and so obviously I did run the Carfax and since then I've run the VIN through a bunch of online services to try to get as much information as I can and put the pieces together. Now another thing I did get from Mr. B was the phone number of the person that he bought the car from, Mr. A. Hello Mr. A if you're out there, very nice man also. And now Mr. A called me back and I have much more information including the actual printout from the last Porsche tech that looked at this car right after things went wrong. Um, so let's have a look. Now Carfax says that the car was sold in 2001 in Las Vegas, Nevada and then was immediately shipped to Newport Beach which if you're a new Porsche that's a pretty nice place to live. Now it stayed there for quite a while and it went to a bunch of different Porsche dealers, had all its services done, had its engine cleaned, transmission was removed, it had new clutch release bearing, flywheel, flex plate, all of that kind of when you would do it if you were a fastidious owner and that kept going for quite some time uh, all the different services replaced bulbs all that Porsche main dealers or Audi main dealers in uh, Southern California then it got sold in 2014 to Hawaii Honolulu Hawaii and then in Hawaii it stayed there for two or three years and then it got shipped back to California and got a service. Now in that service they put on the stainless steel mufflers which I didn't even know that they weren't stock um, but those mufflers we took off they actually you can polish them up and they are a little fancy. I wonder what they sound like. Uh, they also put on the Bilstein uh, struts all round which was nice of them and they did just an all round service. They replaced the headlight switch, flush and filled the brakes, that kind of thing. Then it got sent back to Hawaii and was there for less than a year before it got sold in Los Angeles and that's where Mr. A bought it from. Now I asked Mr. A about the uh, graffiti and he said that he bought it like that because when it was being sold to him they said hey it's not ready for sale yet we're going to paint that car and he said hey why don't you just give me a discount and leave the graffiti on it because I don't care and they did and Mr. A he drove the car uh, for three or four years he said he loved the car and he decided that he would spend some money on it and then he was the one let's have a look at what he did um, hold on he put on new tires he did the starter motor he did all new brakes so um, pads rotors and some other bits and pieces whatever needed to be done uh, he replaced the AOS system, so you were right, David Gray, thank you very much. He also put in a new clutch and new spark plugs and some other things that he, oh, replaced the battery and uh, a few other things that he didn't remember. Uh, but that's, oh my gosh, that's such good news. And so then if we look over here at the final report, so what happened, Mr. Uh, a, he said it was great, he spent all that money on it as his daily driver and then he noticed that the car was starting to run a little rough and that's when he decided, oh my gosh, really, I don't want to deal with that, I'm just going to sell it off before it completely dies and that's when he sold it to Mr. B. Now he was completely honest with Mr. B and as I found out from all of this, both Mr. A and Mr. B were completely honest with each other and honest with me, which is great to know, right? Anyway, so he sold, Mr. A sold the car to Mr. B Mr. B said, oh yeah, okay, it's a little broken, but I'm going to drive it a bit and then fix it up piece by piece. Then what happened is Mr. B was driving it and it really started to run very rough. He described it as being boggy, so um, lacking power and rough. He brought it to this um, independent uh, European car repair place in Orange County, who uh, I'm not going to name them, but if you want to know, I'll, I'll tell you in the comments. They, they were fantastic and they, they charged a reasonable amount of money but I completely agree with it and I got to speak to the actual tech who did the work and they had great notes and they were able to tell me everything, it was amazing. 
So when they brought it in there, they ran um, the computer on it and it came back with PO343 that a cam sensor was coming back with an error. They tested the fuel pressure, it was okay. They tested, uh, or they took off the oil filter and they found small pieces of metal and debris, which they didn't specify here, but he said yes, the brown plastic chips from either the Vario cam pads or the uh, timing rails. Uh, they also removed the cam plugs to check the mechanical timing and found that bank one exhaust, exhaust was off by 15 degrees, which I was so happy to read that because if you remember back uh, episode four and such when we were trying to do the top dead center, bank one seems to be off in the exhaust and that seems to be why bank one has all of that uh, carbon buildup in the cylinders that we had so much trouble with. And so it's encouraging that what they're saying here seems to make sense to what we found in our bungling around trying to figure out what's wrong with the car. Uh, the other thing then is they took off the uh, oil pan uh, to look at the debris and see what was in there and let all the oil out. And that's what they uh, told Mr. B was, listen, the oil is out of there. We really don't recommend you drive that car at all. In order for us to know really what's wrong with it, we'd have to take it apart more, which is 100% true. And so what happened then was they uh, gave Mr. B the bill, which is $634.88, which like I said, completely fair. These people are fantastic. I, I want them to work on my car. But Mr. B is like, oh my gosh, if it's that much money to tell me that they don't really know what's wrong with it and it's gonna cost more, then this car is gonna be incredibly expensive to fix. That's when he decided to cut his losses and sell the car, and that's when I bought it. So that's it. Very encouraging to know this much more about the car. Um, everyone is being honest with each other, which is nice. Um, the car has definitely been loved over the years. And um, it was on the road not much more than a year ago, uh, right after someone spent a bunch of money on it. And so that feels good. Let's get on with it. Let's try to take this engine apart and get this car back on the road. Porsche Special Tools. We couldn't avoid this subject for any longer. And thankfully, David Gray in Pennsylvania sent me this toolkit, which I'm so grateful for. It has the 95951, the little pin, and the 9595, the big pin. Then it has the 9685, which is the thing that locks into the cams and holds them in position. And then this one, I don't really know what you do with this one. It's when you're putting it back together, but it's the camshaft alignment doohickey. So I got one of them now. <laughs> so thank you, David Gray. Amazing. I just, I've said it before, but I just can't say it enough. You guys and girls that have been commenting and helping me really makes a big difference. We're working on a Porsche 996 engine. I've been trying to figure out as much as I can about these engines. Let's start with the engine number. It's right here on the driver's side, right by the oil pan, which is the only clean thing on my engine. Here it is. It looks like it was done by a drunken robot with a laser. Um, let me translate that a little bit. M96 is Motor 96 from 1996. It first appeared in the Boxster. The 04 is for M9604, which is the 3.4 cc, 300 horsepower, 258 pound foot of torque version of this engine. The first six means it's a six cylinder. We got that one. The next six means it's naturally aspirated, as in not a turbo. That one means it's manufactured in 2001, which is good news. And then this next number no one cares about, 15699. That is the serial number of this specific engine. If you have an S in there near the beginning, that means you have an X51 engine, and I'm officially jealous. If you have the AT, then that means you have an Austauschmotor, which is an exchange engine. Not necessarily a bad thing. It means Porsche put a new engine into your car, which has less mileage than the rest of your car. Plus, it may well have an upgraded IMS. Hit the notification bell. It's up there. Yes, please. The wiring harness. Last week, we got the wiring harness off. And I brought it back this week and I cleaned it up uh, using the Windex there and also Back in Black, which is a fantastic product. Definitely no sponsorship, unfortunately. Now, I saved you the video of doing that, but here I am cleaning it up with electronic cleaner, not electric cleaner, electronic cleaner. 
And at the same time, I'm going around the engine and trying to make sure if I know what all of those different things plug into. And it was, it was very valuable. I'd recommend you guys do this as well. For example, you know, you have those, I'm working on that one with the orange uh, rubber around it. And so the small ones are for the Vario cam and the slightly larger ones are for the cam sensors themselves. And it really turned what was kind of a scary mystery into something good. And you can see right there, it comes in on the passenger side, a branch goes off onto the spark plugs on that side. It then zips across over some sensors and does the same thing on the driver's side. And there I'm just labeling everything once I felt confident I knew what it was. Step one, let's find top dead center. If you look at episode four, which is about the compression test and the leak down test and finding top dead center, that's a very good resource to know what's fully going on here. I did find out that they do have the cylinder numbers on top of the engine, which did come in handy today. So here I am on cylinder one, going over to cylinder six, following the firing order, trying to make sure that I felt confident that I had found top dead center. And in short, I didn't feel confident. If you look here, do you see how much dirt is in there? That's an example of all the charcoal deposits in there. So I got carb cleaner. At this stage, you can literally spray the valves directly with that stuff. So here I'm getting the exhaust valves that are underneath. I left that to sit for a little while, which is not shown here. I did the other side as well. Now that drumstick that I'm using, six and a quarter inches or 16 centimeters is where I have that mark. And that's right where the black part as it comes out from the spark plug hole is. That might help you guys get a lead start on what length that should be in order to know where top dead center is. Okay, cleaning it did help. I felt more confident that I'd found top dead center. Now we have to lock it. So we're bringing in that special tool. Thank you again, David Gray. Now the short one, I've seen it listed as for holding the torque converter. And it's the same width as the long one, but the long one really, that's the one you want. It goes into a teardrop shaped hole in the flywheel once it's reached top dead center. You could use a screwdriver, maybe even a drill bit that's just under eight millimeters thick. Here I'm taking off the cam plugs. Thank you, Thomas Jodzio, for recommending using one of these spikes to do that. Um, it is exactly the right tool for it, and it's also the right tool for taking off hoses. So thank you very much, Thomas. I appreciate that lead. Next here, we have to line up that notch. Do you see that there? We were on top dead center, sort of, I guess. But then it does say in the manual that if you want this to be in the right place to start taking heads off, you need that notch to be facing out. And so rotate the crankshaft 360 degrees, and that works. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like me to make more, the best way to tell me is to click that subscribe button. Primary camshaft chain tensioner. Well, on the chain, like you might have on your bike, it's very much like a bike chain. You have to have tension on it because it's running through quite a long distance there. And that's a big nut. I wasn't sure if I had anything that size in the garage. I'm using this micrometer, which cost $10 or so. That wasn't very accurate. It's more accurate, it seems, if you just put it like that. You kind of screw it up less as you take it off. So 32 millimeter, I don't have any 32 millimeter, but you remember that one and a quarter millimeter massive comical thing that I had? Well, it doesn't fit this way, but if you put it on the box wrench part of it, a one and a quarter fits really well. And it turns out a one and a quarter is a 32 millimeter. Who knew? So that worked very well, very easy with all that leverage to break it. And then it kind of pushed out into my hand because it is spring loaded and that's what holds a constant tension on the timing chain. Next, we have to lock the cams. We need to make sure that when we get everything in top dead center, that they don't move and change that. Here, I'm using one of the screws from the clutch plate. It didn't seem like it fitted at all, but once I cleaned out that hole with brake cleaner and then lubed it up with WD-40, it fit like butter. 
but I soon found that there was a little bit of a problem. It all snugged up lovely, but then it didn't go into anything or hold anything. Oh dear. Now, I had heard about three chain and five chain engines. This has a key at the bottom, which means it's a five chain engine, which is older. Turns out that David Gray has a nice Porsche, a newer one. He has a three chain. I feel a diagram coming on. M96 five chain engine. Here we go. In the center, we have the crankshaft, and that is the main part of the engine. The point of its existence is to turn the crankshaft. The power from that, some of the power, goes off to the intermediate shaft. It's called intermediate because it's between something, and it's between the crankshaft and the camshafts. And so the intermediate shaft allows that chain from the crankshaft to get split in two. And one chain goes off onto bank one, and one chain goes to bank two. On bank one here at the top, we have the intake cam, because the intake where all the air comes in is on the top. Underneath, we have the exhaust cam. The exhaust is connected underneath, and they are connected to each other by their own chain and timed to each other with that chain. And then they get their power from the intermediate shaft with another longer chain. Now with long chains like that, they need a guide to stop them from flapping around and take up any slack as they get older. On this car, there is this rail that we've talked about and it may be one of the items that has damage on it. Now that has a tensioner on it that we just undid, uh, which is spring loaded to try to maintain a constant pressure as the, as the system ages really and becomes slack, it takes up the slack. There's another rail on the other side for the same reason. And then on the chain that's on the cams itself, we have a Vario cam. Now this Vario cam that we've talked about, really it's kind of an on off thing. If you are idling or poodling about, it's in one position. If you start driving it like you stole it, it can change the timing of the cams and make it work better for that situation. Over here now we have, this is the intermediate shaft chain, rail and tensioner. Same sort of thing, same sort of reason as all the other chains. We'll come to that later on. And then bank two is the same as bank one. I'm beginning to feel like it's sort of the same thing, but sort of spun upside down and backwards, you know? Anyway, at the top, it still has the intake cam and on the bottom is the exhaust cam. And then it gets a chain for itself coming all over there from the intermediate shaft. And then for all those same reasons, it gets these rails on there and tensioners to keep the chain in tension as everything ages. You notice it's kind of like a mirror image or flipped image of the other side. I think there's something going on with that. Maybe you guys in the comments could spread some light on what I'm thinking here. So on bank two then, there's a chain all to itself and those cams then are timed to each other. And that's why there's only one key on a five chain engine is because if you just get one of those keys in time, it's gonna be already in time with the other cam. And that then is one, two, three, four, five chains, ba-boom. So what about the three chain engine, which is an M9603? Even though it's a lower number, it actually came after in 2002. Very, very similar, but there are differences. And so we have the crankshaft again, which is the engine's reason to exist. Then it goes to an intermediate shaft. Again, probably most of those being single row, so more of the problematic ones in that regard. It has a chain, which is the intermediate shaft chain. Over on bank one, we still have an intake and an exhaust. On bank two, we have the intake and exhaust again. So the main difference here is they're using less parts, less chains. And in this case, that change in engineering did result in more reliability with other benefits. You can see here for bank one, it just gets one chain that covers both of those cams. Same on bank two. And that's why you need a key on both cams as it's possible one of those guys could slip independently and uh, you would want to know that. Instead of a Vario cam, this has Vario cam plus, which is an infinitely variable valve timing device. And that allows the engine to choose whatever timing it wants based on what's going on at that present time. 
and that's one of the reasons why the M9603 has more horsepower than the M9604. So that's just one, two and three chains, so a simpler system that has more efficiency, less parts. It's better. All right, next we need to take off the plate that is holding in that Vario cam. Just two 10 millimeters on that one. If you have a 10 millimeter and a 13 millimeter on a Porsche, you can do some real damage. Okay, now we are moving on to these scavenger pumps in the head, four 10 millimeters there to take that off. Now this is an incredibly tight fit, so I'm using a combination of cleaner and then WD-40 to try to lube my way in, using a regular old hammer there to try to open that up. And in the end, the key was, it's such a tight fit, you need to pull each side evenly. So I'm using a rubber hammer to whack it back in, and then two hammers at the same time, and that was magic. It came out like butter. I kind of foolishly stopped using the two hammers too soon. I'd recommend doing that until it just comes out. Then at this time I marked it with a razor, but really if you get that triangle in the middle pointing towards the center of the engine, you're in good shape. Step nine, the cylinder head cover. Oh my God, we're almost inside. 10 millimeters here, there are 23 of them. When you got 23, you're good. Now that's me trying to stick a magnetic bolt holder onto a car that's mostly aluminum. I ended up sticking it onto the engine stand. So when you get all 23 of those out, they're all exactly the same, low stress. I'd had such success with that hammer earlier. I just used that in a number of places, sort of gently nudging, nudging, and it came off. Now you will notice that RTV there. I have learned that it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be mostly in the engine. So it makes me feel like somebody was in there that wasn't a Porsche person, I wonder. Looks pretty clean in there. That's the next mystery. Very excited to have made it this far. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Till next time.